millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because, let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high-quality, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork-raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com etm. And use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. If you're ready to get a clue about investing and take charge of your financial future, this episode is for you. Before you sink a dollar into the stock market, you need to know author Susan Laubach's seven rules to invest effectively and make your money grow. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future too and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. Welcome back to the show. It is so good to have you here. You know, sometimes someone comes along and you just feel an instant connection to them. Have you ever had that happen? It's really cool. Susan is like our resident grandma. I hope she doesn't mind me calling her that, who knows a lot about investing. She's a former Wall Street stockbroker and financial educator, and she's taught several levels of investment education to students everywhere from 18 to 74. And Better Investing Magazine called her previous book the most well-rounded source of basic stock information and education. So Susan knows what she's talking about when it comes to investing. In this episode, Susan is sharing learnings from her recent book, Rumpelstiltskin's Rules for Making Your Farthings Grow. This book is amazing. It's told through these entertaining retellings of fables and fairy tales that you already know by heart. But Susan helps really demystify the world of investing and teach you seven powerful rules of investing that are going to serve as a foundation for going forward. So it's just a really interesting way to teach you about investing. When somebody like Susan comes on the show, I listen up because I know that she has decades of advice that 
I really want to know. She's been in this business a really long time, and to be successful for this long, she's just got some teachings that I think are really, really important. You'll learn more about these seven investing rules. You'll get a look at what it was like to be a female stockbroker before there were female stockbrokers. And you'll understand how to never pay too much for a company stock and just so much more in this interview. Well, Susan, I am so, so thrilled to have you join us on the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Believe me. I don't normally start out with sharing someone's story, but I think it really makes sense here. From what I know, you spent 15 years in the investment business as a stockbroker, broker trainer, and in 2006, you actually returned back to your original career in theater. You've written <laughs> and performed on off-off-Broadway, television, film, all sorts of things. You've written a couple of books. You wrote a book called The Whole Kit and Caboodle, A Painless Journey to Investment Enlightenment, which sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. And your your new book, Rumpelstiltskin's Rules for Making Your Farthings Grow. So tell us a little bit about this career going from originally in theater to stockbroker. What was this like? Well, I was in theater for a very, very long time, uh, managed a theater. Um, I was a, uh, a resident uh, actor um, and resident playwright. Uh, and then uh, it became clear that equity pay wasn't going to put my kids through college. So uh, I changed careers and uh, went into briefly in the insurance business and then switched over to the investment business and was hired as a stockbroker. And I did that. Uh, as you mentioned, for the next uh, at least 15 years. Um, then I, I did quite a few years uh, evaluating portfolios after that, which I probably didn't mention in the bio. But uh, yeah, that. and then now I'm back in the theater again. Now I'm, I'm back uh, playwriting and writing my books and, um, and uh <laughs> educating people uh, for their finances. And that's what the book is meant to do. Isn't it amazing how life journey, how it, it, it bobs and weaves. Nobody has a straight line story, which I think is so cool. Yeah. Well, your, your story is very interesting too. Uh, but the thing is, mine is sort of this through line of uh, uh, communicating, educating. I mean, when, you know, playwriting is really in a sense, educating as well, certainly communicating. Um, but that's, that's sort of uh, what I've always been doing no matter what form it's been taking but this latest um book uh and i had written children's books prior to the uh, kitten caboodle book i had and i wrote a travel book also i had written seven books prior to this uh but this one came about uh, shannon because you and i know that there are a lot of people who are just terribly fearful of getting into the market, putting themselves in the hands of a stockbroker that they don't know or uh, for one reason or another. They're just not ready to get started because they feel unschooled in what's ahead. And uh, so uh, since I have taught many, many adults and a lot of people who are in this situation, I realize that um, people really don't remember stuff that in general kind of bores them. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, unless it's uh, it told in a story form. Uh, so um, I thought that if I would write, if I would embed these things that I think are absolutely necessary uh, for a person considering investing in the stock market, if I would embed them in uh, sort of retold fairy tales that are pretty silly, I will admit, um, and I hope they make people smile, if not laugh out loud. Uh, and and by embedding them in these stories, I'm hoping that it will be much more memorable, that they'll they'll think back on these rules. And, and uh, I, I call them rules. They're things that I think are very necessary. And um, I'm, I'm not sure you you know what the rules are? Do you have a have a list of them? There? I have a list of the seven rules, yeah, I believe. Yeah, so yeah. I would love to walk through uh, at least a few of them because I, yeah. I think they're really amazing. And number one is just slow but steady wins the race. And I think it's really interesting. I'd love your perspective because 
I know a lot of the younger generations right now are kind of hoping that they do the get rich quick scheme when it comes to investing. And some people have made a lot of money in a really short period of time, but it normally does take many, many, many years for your portfolio to grow. So tell me about being slow, but steady. Well, uh, going back to what you say about getting rich quick, um, quickly, um, it, the uh, issue with that is that's not investing. I mean, investing implies that you, you're putting something in something and you're looking for it to grow and over time uh, to pay back, to vest. Um, and slow but steady wins the race, I tell through the story of the turtle and the hare and uh, how Tom the turtle wins the race. And uh, he um, has learned from his father that uh, he is a turtle and he's therefore slow. And he has to, he learned that he has to just get started and keep going no matter what uh, stands in the way. And if he does that, he'll win the race. And um, in my little story, uh, he wins a lot of money and he puts it in the stock market. And by being slow, but steady, um, he makes a lot of money. So uh, that's my slow, but steady story. And uh, the other thing I would say is uh, you got to get started. <laughs> you got to get started. And uh, it, the the problem, I think, with a lot of kids is that if they don't get rich overnight, um, they think it can't be done. Or they maybe they lost their first little tiny nest egg by trying to do it overnight. And so they stand back and think, I'll do something else, you know. Um, but uh if if you adhere to these rules and ask these questions and then you say i'm going to start small and i will put it into i will put my money into something in which i uh, am pretty sure has a good chance of being a long term growth company um and i'll see what happens and if I feel good about it, I'll put more money in. And if the market tanks on me, which you and I know happens, uh, then I'll buy more. And in that sense, and if we're talking about young people, if we're talking about people who are in their twenties, they just got out of college, or um, or even older people who have never had any money but they inherit it, or they you know, get a, a divorce settlement or something like that, um, they the young people really do have years and years and years to watch right. this, <laughs> you know, and this is the time for them to start in uh, to get started and then slow, but steady will win the race. So why do you think investing is, it's obviously something that we know we need to do, but why do we wait or why do we feel intimidated? I think it's because there's so much jargon in the business and um, there are so many, pardon me, stockbrokers who talk too fast <laughs> and, and they put people off. They make people feel dumb. Uh, Shannon, between you and me, they make, make women feel dumb a yes. lot of times. And then the women are just not going to go there. They're going to go, you know, put their money in the bank and watch it not grow at all. Um, and so I think that the problem has to do with the way the business has been communicated. Warren Buffett's a wonderful guy to uh, read and follow because he talks very simply uh, and he says things very straightforward. Uh, for example, in this, uh, you know, great run up on the market, um, he's, he said during the last run up, that he's just waiting for the tide to go out and see who was swimming naked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, he talks like that and he makes things very, very easy to understand for people. Um, uh, so it doesn't need to be uh, complicated, but you look at the business page or you watch one of these, uh, you know, business programs and you can get very confused just by the language that is used. So having had to learn uh, this business coming from theater where I knew nothing, nobody I knew knew anything. Um, I had never invested. I didn't know the difference between a stock or a bond, believe it or not. Uh, and 
so I remember the learning process very well and how hard it was and where the roadblocks were. And so that's why I think I'm a good teacher. It was uh, interesting because I went to work for the oldest investment banking firm in the Western Hemisphere and indeed the third oldest in the entire world. And I was only the second woman they had ever hired. Wow. Yeah. And they told me that the first woman hadn't worked out all that well. And I thought that was hilarious. That was like saying you'd read a book, but you didn't like it. So you were never going to read the book. I, just, I, I was dumbfounded by that comment. But they hired me because uh, I think at the time Goldman had been sued by some women. And I think that they that, that my fine company, and it was truly a fine company, just didn't want to have the attention uh, that not having any women might bring. So um, I, th- I think that's why I was hired. And I knew some people that, who were partners in that in that fine company. And um, and I I got the job and I more or less learned on the job because once they hired me, they thought, well, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go learn the difference between a stock and a bond. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I really loved that company. It was Alex Brown and Sons, and it was just, it was an absolutely wonderful, high quality group of gentlemen, just fine gentlemen. In fact, they had a, they had a sobriquet. They were called the Gentlemen of Wall Street. So I sort of blew that when I came in. <laughs> they blew me in that, but... <laughs> That sounds like that could be a whole play you could write. <laughs> well, I did include the whole thing in one show that I, one play that I wrote because the hiring process was really sort of funny too. But, um, but anyway, all the, the whole time that I was uh, brokering, I was also teaching. Uh, I was teaching investing and uh, to that end, um, I wrote the first uh, book and now I've written this second book and I'm very interested in in your uh, listeners uh, knowing about it and I really appreciate your talking to me about it. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to I'm going to skip around on a, a couple of these seven rules. I want to talk about uh, number 3 because I think this one's really interesting. The difference between a loaner to and an owner of a company. Talk to me about that. Well, uh, you know, uh, a loaner, when you loan a company or an entity money, um, you are, in fact, buying a bond which will pay you interest. And that's um, a fixed income uh, that you receive as interest payments. And then at the end of the time period, for however long you have loaned the entity your money, um, you will get your money back. You will get it back, provided you invested or rather you loaned your money to a a company or an entity of high quality. And that's not investing. That's a loan. You don't own anything of that company. In fact, they have borrowed money from you. Uh, The owner of a company is an investor. As a stock owner, you are an investor and an owner of a piece of that company. And and then, you know, I, I used to say to people, you own the company. Do you want them to sell cigarettes or liquor? Or, I mean, is there something in your value system that says this company might not be the right fit for you? you got to know that sort of stuff. But you may find out that it's investing in something you have no interest in uh, and really disapprove of. But you are an owner. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. 
but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. I think that's really important to think about because especially now with technology, it's very easy to feel disconnected. If let's say I buy a share of, I'm just picking something out of the blue, Amazon or Apple or whatever it might be. I, I, I almost don't feel like I'm an owner, but I think that's important to think about. Do I actually agree with these, this company's policies? Do I like what they sell, et cetera, et cetera, because you are in fact an owner. That's exactly right. And the problem with conglomerates and with um, companies that are enormous with many, many uh, small companies within them is that you might love half of what they do and disapprove of the other half. And then you just have to sort of make up your mind. You think the good they do outweighs the bad they do. Um, It it certainly would be the case uh, with Amazon, which I absolutely love. And I'm a big customer of Amazon and an investor. And the, the, the thing with, uh, conglomerates, I shouldn't really mention a name, but the thing with conglomerates is that it makes it much more difficult for you to know um, what what they uh, own. And so I suggest strongly uh, Value Line. Um, Value Line will give you all the information you need to have to see if this company has the right value system for you. Um, if you're, I'll, I'll go through what value line is because I'm sure you yeah. know about it. Um, you can, most business libraries have a subscription to value line. Uh, it is a, uh, an independent company with 90 industry analysts, all very highly thought of and all independent uh, of any outside influence. And they cover a, a vast number of companies within a very large portfolio of industries. Um, they they uh, come out every 13 weeks with a whole new um, uh, uh, variety of uh, reports. And you can go to those reports in your library. You can also, of course, subscribe to it on your own online, or they'll send you uh, hard copies. Uh, and you can get all the information you need to know 
what companies, what, what businesses these companies are in, how much is institutionally owned, what the earnings estimates are, what the past numbers are. It's, it's very, very informative. In fact, I gave a class on how to read value line. And uh, I, I just think it is so uh, important. It's, it's one of the, well, it is the best research tool that I know an independent uh, investor can have. Wow. Okay. That is an amazing tip. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to talk about number five, because I think this is oh, yeah. <laughs> something that a lot of people are uh, not sure how to think about this one. It's never pay too much for shares of a company stock. How in the world do we know if we're paying too much? Okay. That's um, that's a little more complicated an answer. So um, let me know if I'm if I'm too confusing on this. It's called the peg ratio, and that is the P/E price divided by earnings. The P/E uh, equal to or less than the growth rate in those earnings. So I'll just give you an example. Let's say that um, company A is priced at $10 a share, and it is expected to earn $1 this year. You know, that would be divided amongst all the shares. So the price earnings ratio, $10 divided by the, the $1, is 10. So you would not want to pay a higher PE than the, the rather, the growth rate. I, I skipped a step. The PE is 10. So now you need to find out what the anticipated growth rate in that $1 is for the future. You can find that out by looking at value line. And there are other services that do um, estimates, uh, company estimates, uh, and can be found on Google. Find out what they are expected to earn next year, the year after, perhaps a three to five year outlook, which is what Value Line does. And if the three to five year outlook is that they will earn or they will grow rather by at least 10%, that's the growth rate, at least 10%, then you're paying the right price if you pay $10. If you if the stock is $30 and it's only earning $1 and it's only growing at 10%, that's way overpriced. Now, there's one thing about stocks that are way overpriced. Sometimes they always are, and I don't mean just in this last flashy tech you know, bubble. Yes. Uh, if they are always selling at a premium price, that says that the institutional community, those people who buy for very large portfolios, believes that this company is worth a premium multiple, that this company is has such a solid balance sheet and they're A plus rated uh, by the rating uh, services that they will earn a premium PE, premium multiple, multiple and PE, the same thing. So here I am speaking in, germ, in a jargon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But so the PEG ratio or PE equal to or less than the growth rate, PEG, is a way to determine whether the price is too high. Uh, it, so there were years, believe it or not, in my long career, when the price when the PE was less than the growth rate. And wow, what a pleasure it was to find something like that. Um, if you then went through and did the research and found out that they weren't expected to go bankrupt in the next 30 days. Uh, but um, if, 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 did I make that clear or was yes. that just way too? <laughs> no, no, that was, that was very clear. Uh, so how do you know then, let's say you found a good stock and you realized it's not overpriced. Is there a simple or sort of simplistic way to figure out when do I sell that? Well, you're investing, remember. You have made your choice carefully. You have determined that this company is worth owning. 
Uh, therefore, the reasons to sell don't have to do with the fact that they went up. That's what you wanted it to do. Now, there are people who have to sell to pay for their college tuition or they want to go buy a house or, you know, one of those reasons. Uh, then you may decide not to sell that wonderful stock, but to borrow against it, which you can do. You can borrow against your stock portfolio for a lot less money than the, generally than the bank charges. Uh, but all that aside, how do you know when to sell? My advice would be you sell when the basic story has changed. In other words, you bought it because of this top manager. This guy at the top is a genius. Well, he leaves and you don't know anything about the people who are coming in or they don't have the same repu reputation. A reason to sell or they are selling off the um, portion of their company that you thought was the best portion in it. Time to sell. In other words, when the original story changes, then you have to reevaluate if you still want to own this company or not. If you don't, that's the time to sell. But my advice for an investor is that you don't sell just because it went up. Now, here's another thing that I would suggest. If you have people who are um, basically, you know, they, they're just very jittery about the market and who isn't almost all the time. But I mean, in general, just very, very jittery right about now. Everything is up. Their stock is doubled, tripled, quadrupled, whatever. If they feel this way, they could take the step of selling just as much as they put into the stock. In other mm -hmm. words, your $10 stock is now 50. Okay, you put 10 in. Take your $10 out and let the let the rest ride so that you at least feel that you have um, gotten out your original investment and yet you let the other stuff stay on the table and continue to work for you. I like that advice. That feels really good. Very tangible. Yeah, good. <laughs> good. Doable, I hope. <laughs> and what about the difference between, because I get this question a lot on the show, the difference between buying stocks, investing, investing in maybe my 401k or my IRA with, with mutual funds and then ETFs are a thing. So how do we figure out these these different buckets? Oh, that's a good question because it, it is a, such a question now that there are so many different kinds of things, ways in which you can invest. My uh, real favorite, and I followed it since they came out with their very first ETF many years ago. Um, I loved them from the start. Uh, when uh, ETFs first came out, um, they were a single offering by Barclays Bank, and um, they had special uh, advantages for the institutional investor. And I was an institutional stockbroker at the time. Uh, those special um, those special things are, are of, of no interest, really, to the individual investor. They still are in place, but they're of no interest. The individual now has the opportunity through, oh, are there hundreds of ETFs? I mean, they have just exploded because you can buy a basket of stocks in the industry that you're interested in, but you're not particularly interested in finding a single company in that industry. But you can buy the whole industry uh, or uh, uh, the portion that you're interested in in a basket of stocks, and it is traded in real time. Now, what that means is that you don't have to wait until the market closes to get the price. And that's what happens with mutual funds. You have to wait until the end of the day and take that price for either the buy or the sell. Uh, with ETFs, they trade all day long. And furthermore, they're not managed. So you don't pay a management fee. You pay, you buy them like you buy a stock. And you can, let's say at 11 o'clock in the morning, it hits um, 15. You can buy it at 15. You don't have to wait until the end of the day when it's priced at whatever price that might be, which could be considerably higher. Uh, so does that make sense? My, my yes. preference, my preference, I, I have a couple of mutual funds that I'm very fond of and that I believe in, but I, as you know, I can't give advice yes. the regulatory issues uh so i won't mention them but for in general i prefer 
ETFs. And I love individual companies. As long as you have done, the investor has done the research and has uh, found, um, for instance, your brother goes to work for the company and you want to you want to support him by buying stock great good idea go to value line look it up find out if the price is attractive find out if the business is what you it matches your value system and then do it and that's a good reason for buying an individual stock uh, or you see a particular uh, company i mean here in new york my lord you see so much um construction going on and uh, you see certain things that are used in every single construction site and you might think to yourself wow that really looks like it's a growth stock i'm going to go check it out and you may or may not find that it is a growth stock that is publicly traded which means you can buy it on the exchanges uh, or over the counter um and so that's another reason for buying an individual stock but without that kind of deep interest and in, in time to do it, do the research, uh, I would go with your ETF. I like that advice. That's great. I, I want to talk about number seven, okay. diversify. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of times uh, we can look at our portfolio and say, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> we own way too much of one stock or we're not diversified. And a lot of people are curious, what does that even mean to be diversified? So tell us a little bit about the the seventh rule. Well, uh, diversity in this particular case um, really means balancing your portfolio between those things you own and those things, those entities to whom you have loaned money. Um, And uh, I have years ago. I always taught the four season portfolio, which I thought uh, would be easily understood when people realized that the seasons uh, would uh, of the uh, of our climate uh, would match the kind of things they should have in their portfolio. For example, spring is a perfect time for growth stocks uh, because things grow in the spring. You know that. The, the climate is right, you know, with uh, warm days and cool nights, you get things that grow. So um, buying uh, uh, emerging companies or good companies that you've researched to follow that portion of your portfolio is a good idea. Um, and then you have summer and summer is a time when things, uh, you know, have come out of the ground and now you just are watching over them. This is the time for large, mature growth companies, the bigger companies, not the emerging companies that you might have bought for your spring portion. Uh, the fall is a time of great upheaval, as we know, and uncertainty, uncertainty about interest rates, about the future in every way. And for that, I think uh, convertible bonds and convertible stocks or, or convertible preferreds are very good things to have. And we won't go into the structure of those because it's a little confusing. We don't really have time, but something to uh, to consider for the fall. Um, another thing uh, for winter when, you know, nothing is growing and you just batten down the hatches and keep your head down uh For winter, that's when you put your bonds, your fixed income, something that's high quality, that's going to pay you interest no matter what. Uh, So that's my little quick explanation of the four season portfolio, which I decided upon many, many years ago, but is is how I sort of explain diversifying. Um, Basically, it's really just uh, putting um, uh, uh, stocks and bonds in a balanced portfolio, meaning, I don't know, 50% stocks, 50% bonds, uh, or 60-40, or whatever uh, your um, whatever your particular, uh, what would I say, um, your tranquility measure. <laughs> right. <laughs> How yeah. much risk do you want to undertake? Because, you know, anything in this area is risky. Is has a risk. I won't say it's risky, but everything bears a risk. Not investing is a huge risk. Yes, I agree. I love that about the seasons. That is that is so cool. I've never heard that before. I made it up. 
<laughs> but that, it makes a lot of sense. And it suddenly adds some great, like, shining light. I was like, okay, this makes sense. I love that. Good. <laughs> so I, I'm curious if, if you had some words of wisdom for your younger self, someone who might be listening right now about the power investing or getting started investing or even just hanging in there with investing, what would you, what would you tell your younger self? I would tell my younger self to get a subscription to Value Line and to look at it regularly and to become familiar with it and uh, to um, use Value Line to direct you into your first investment or your, your, you know where you want to put your money first in the investment world and then just get started and keep going. I like that. That's great advice. Well, we kind of jumped around a little bit of the seven rules. I just wanted to tease it because I want to make sure that everybody picks up a copy of the book and really dives into it. So so tell everyone where they can go to connect with you and to get a copy of the book, Rumpelstiltskin's Rules for Making Your Farthing. Am I saying that right? Farthing. Farthings. Farthings grow. Farthings. There we go. Farthings grow. Yeah. It's also an English lesson. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, it's on Amazon and Kindle, and I also recorded it for Audible. Well, I have to admit, I got a really good education in understanding the PEG ratio from Susan, and it's already changed how I'm looking at companies and how I'm thinking about investing. And Value Line, I totally forgot about them until Susan brought them up, but I just went over and checked out their site and they've got some great free educational videos and even a free seven day trial. So if that's something you're interested in, obviously Susan has given it a very, very high plug. But I think Susan has this gift for making investing easy to understand. And I think it's really brilliant to share these rules through fables and fairy tales that we already know, because it's like, oh, okay, it suddenly makes sense. We're not talking about all of these terms and vocabulary that is confusing. It's, okay, we we understand it through the fairy tale. So I, I just think it's really brilliant. It just makes sense. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor, share it with a friend and family member, anyone who you know is really interested in investing. And as always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guest, as well as our amazing episode sponsors who make this podcast possible. 